The Tiger I was a formidable machine that pushed the boundaries of armored warfare and forced the Allies to devise better tanks. It powerfully symbolized all of the might of the Nazi war machine, as dreamed of by Hitler, and later turned through propaganda into a Wunderwaffe in a mostly defensive war. The Tiger, like all new tanks, had teething problems at first, and it was never an easy tank to maintain, but it was always deadly effective with up to a 19 to 1 kill ratio. When it first appeared in 1942, it struck terror into the hearts of Allied tank crews. Allied tank crews found themselves hopeless with their inadequate machines, having to improvise costly tactics to deal with it. The Tiger gave fame to a few World War II tank aces like Michael Whitman, something rarely heard of before. Before the invasion of the Soviet Union, the German armed forces were not aware of two newly developed Soviet tanks, the T-34 and the KV. At the beginning of Operation Barbarossa, the Germans were expecting little from their opponents' tank forces, which were mainly composed of the old T-26 and BTs. As a result, they were surprised when they met the T-34 and KVs in combat for the first time in June 1941. Especially at the beginning of World War II, the technical superiority of the T-34 has become the stuff of legend. Well armed and protected, fast and maneuverable, it was unequaled on the battlefield until 1942. Some go as far as to claim the T-34 as the finest tank of the 20th century. The year 1942 deserves particular attention because at the operational level, the sides were more evenly matched. In this year, the most common Soviet main battle tank was the T-34-76. The most common German main battle tank were Panzer III's with long and short 50mm cannons. And Panzer IV's, mostly still with short 75mm L-24 guns. The Panzer IV and Stug assault guns with long 75mm L-43 or L-48 guns had only begun appearing on the East Front in limited numbers. Hence, for most of 1942, the majority of German tanks were still the older and apparently obsolete types. Also, contrary to the German tank models, the T-34 used sloped armor. It was the first mass-produced tank to fully use the advantages of this kind of solution. The Germans were shocked to encounter large numbers of T-34, which were resistant to tank and anti-tank guns. The introduction of the Tiger I tank was meant to solve this problem. The first Tigers rolled out to face the Red Army on the Eastern Front near Leningrad on September 1942. During that time, the Tiger quickly established a fearsome reputation. Its thick armor startled crews that despairingly saw their shells bounce off the Tiger's hull and turret. It is widely believed that the T-34 was the first tank ever to use sloped armor. However, this is not true. French tanks like the Samoa S-35 and Renault R-35 already had sloped armor. In World War I, sloped armor had been partially implemented by the French on their first tank, the Schneider CA-1. The Germans did some studies on the use of sloped armor before World War II. They even incorporated it in their later designs such as the Panther and the King Tiger. So, why didn't the Tiger look like this? Sloping the armor would have allowed reducing the weight while retaining the same amount of protection, which would have resulted in a light and therefore more mobile tank. However, the Germans had several reasons not to use it. First of all, German engineers knew about the benefits of sloped armor when they designed the Tiger I, but they trusted their superior steel quality. The 100mm of frontal armor was more than enough to stop enemy rounds at the time, even at a 90 degree angle. Also, the Tiger crews received extensive training to position their tanks at a perfect angle to the enemy so that the armor thickness would be optimized. Sloped armor reduces the tank volume, resulting in reduced space for internal modules and crew space. Sloped armor drastically decreased internal volume for a given size, which means reduced crew efficacy for smaller hulls due to cramping, 
and the increased likelihood that any penetrating shot will take out an important subsystem. German tanks had a huge transmission in the front as well as a big radio unit. There was not much space to move this equipment back to allow for a sloped front. It's worth noting that the ammunition is stowed along the sides of the tank, protected by the inferior side armor. The number of rounds the Tiger could carry would have been severely reduced by sloping the sides. Sloped armor limits the gun size. Sloped armor limits the gun size. This is one of the major points against sloped armor. So assuming you place the sides of the tank at that maximum width and slope the armor plates inward, you are now reducing the roof width of the tank. Why is that important? Because the turret ring has to fit between the sides, essentially onto the roof. So by sloping the sides, you're reducing your turret ring diameter. And the turret ring size is the greatest factor that determines turret and therefore gun size. You want a big gun. You need a big turret. You need a big turret ring diameter. Sloped armor changes the center of gravity in the tank. Sloped armor changes the center of gravity. There were tests done with sloped armor on the Panzer IV, the K variant. They revealed that a sloped frontal plate would move the center of gravity even further to the front. The same issue could be expected for the Tiger. In the end, the engineers thought that their approach was good enough and that the disadvantages of sloped armor outweighed the advantages. Nevertheless, the Tiger I is arguably the most famous tank of the Second World War. The impenetrable armor, powerful gun, and huge size of the Tiger made it a legend in its time. During World War II, only 1,347 were built between August 1942 and August 1944. After August 1944, production of the Tiger I was phased out in favor of the Tiger II. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share. Also, visit our second channel with military power comparisons. See you next time!